Welcome back to the Kilowatts. In this video, you've joined me with two very similar looking, very similarly spec 2022 Tesla Model Ys. But there's one key difference. This one was built in Fremont, California with the 2170 battery cells, and this one in Austin, Texas with the 4680s and structural pack. So in this video, we're gonna be looking from a consumer's perspective to see any other key differences between these two vehicles. So without further ado, let's get started. At first glance, these two vehicles appear almost identical. So let's cover the basics. The Model Y dual motor that's currently exclusively built in Austin, Texas, starts at 61,990, while the dual motor long range Model Ys that are built in California start at 65,990. At this time, the Austin built cars have been available only to Tesla's employees and on a couple of rare occasions, they've been available in Tesla's inventory. And that's how I got mine. As an off menu item, several of the details about the Model Y with 4680 cells and the structurally integrated pack are still unknown. However, because Tesla has been known to constantly iterate on their vehicles by adding new hardware and undocumented features, as well as occasionally redesigning to save on the cost of goods sold, I'm gonna be looking to identify as many differences as I can between these two vehicles without tearing it down like Sandy Monroe. First, let's look at the exterior. I know a lot of people like to complain about the fit and finish of Tesla's vehicles, but in my experience, they're no better or worse in this department than any other brand. The paint on both of the vehicles is very good with only a slight bit of orange peel that's almost imperceptible on camera. Surprisingly, and hopefully unique to my inventory build, I did notice that the Fremont build has slightly better fit on a few panels, with the Austin build featuring slightly looser fitment of the front bumper and misalignment of one of the doors. As for the rest of the exterior hardware, the headlights, taillights, cameras, and sensors all appear to be identical. Finally, while neither vehicle was configured with a tow hitch, you know we had to check and it appears there are no clear differences here either. Inside these vehicles, we begin to find some real differences. The most notable change is the addition of this parcel shelf in the trunk. The shelf itself sits upon a new plastic ledge between the hatch and the top of the second row set of seats. While it is broken up into three parts for maneuverability and folding, I personally find it a bit unwieldy and difficult to store. Historically, Model Y customers who wanted something like this had to go to the aftermarket, and I'll link one of my favorites below. I'm sure there will be a lot of customers who appreciate the addition of this to help prevent theft and potentially make the cabin a bit quieter, but I personally will probably remove this large rigid cover to maximize rear cargo space. Around that same area, we begin to find another small change to the Austin built Model Y. Back here in the trunk, it appears Tesla has extended the area covered by carpet. Previously, much of this area was plastic, and while I don't think this will impact passenger comfort significantly, I could see it resulting in a slightly quieter cabin as carpet dampens sound better than plastic. Looking around at the rest of the rear interior, everything else appears to be essentially the same. The second row set of seats still recline to three optional positions and still fold to an almost flat floor in line with the two rear sub trunk covers. Let's move on to the front seats. Once again, we found some carpeting where there used to be more plastic in the footwell here, but we also found one other minor change to the passenger side seat. With our Austin built Model Y, there is no longer a cutout for lumbar support controls. As many of you may know already, Tesla removed passenger lumbar support from their vehicles, but still delivered their cars with a hole cutout that's capped, potentially to save on cost so they could use many of the same parts for their vehicles that are configured for right-hand drive countries. Now, I might be reading into it too far here, but in my mind, this could suggest that the Austin built Model Ys are not intended for export to right-hand drive countries. Beyond that, however, I struggled to find any other meaningful differences between these two vehicles in the front. However, while the armrest and center console appeared at first to be identical, Tesla has made one small change that should improve on their reliability. The Austin built Model Ys now have a magnetic closing armrest like the new Model S and X, rather than the physical spring-loaded latch that we're used to from the Fremont built Model Ys. I'll admit, most of the changes we've identified would go unnoticed by most customers so far. But before we go for a drive, let's dive into the frunk. At first glance, there's no significant differences up here with both cars sharing identical vents for the HEPA filters and front trunk tubs, but I'm not stopping there. Let's go a bit deeper. After removing some of the essential trim, I can finally show you a part of what makes the Austin built Model Y so special. If you look closely, you can see one of the massive metal castings that make up the majority of the frame of this car. That casting replaces hundreds of separate stamped and welded parts and makes the Austin built Model Y more rigid and less expensive to manufacture. 
One additional feature I didn't expect to find is this little cutout here. When I first saw it, I thought it was intended to make it easier to service the suspension components, but after comparing it to the Fremont build, I realized that it's actually for draining water off of the windshield. So not only is Tesla using this big casting to replace metal parts, but they've actually removed a couple plastic parts with the castings as well. With our walkthrough complete, let's go for a drive and talk about how these two cars compare on the road. All right, so now we're in the Fremont Model Y sitting at 97% state of charge and we're gonna give it a little zero to 60 run to see how quick it is compared to the Austin built Model Y. There's 40, 50, 60. After completing several zero to 60 runs, the Fremont build did 4.71 seconds. Let's see about the Austin build. That's 60 there. Five seconds flat. All right, from this point, let's go check the sound levels. I think the Austin built Model Y should be quieter than the Fremont built Model Y. As I'm on the highway here, I'm gonna put my cruise control on at 65 and let's go ahead and check the noise levels. So we're getting about 66, 67 decibels here in the Fremont Model Y. Now let's switch over to the Austin built Model Y. It's pretty good, I'm seeing 62, 63 decibels. Finally, let's talk about charging the Austin built Model Y, specifically at a version three station. So here we notice that the Austin built Model Y jumps almost instantly to 235 kilowatts, which is abnormal. Normally there's a bit of a ramp up. The 2170s need some time to get up to 250 kilowatts. Other than that though, the charge curve looks pretty similar to the 2170 battery. Recharging 25% in six minutes, 50% in 15 minutes, and 75% is recharged in just 30 minutes. After that, the rate of charge really begins to taper off and it takes a full hour and 10 minutes to get it to full. One last thing I wanted to mention was the first time we ever went to go charge this Model Y, we noticed that it wasn't limiting our acceleration or at least those little dots didn't show up. And then finally, once it was full, the dots didn't show up limiting our regenerative braking. So I made the potentially wrong assumption that this car had somehow more capacity. However, when we've gone to charge more recently, we've noticed that once you're truly at full, you do begin to have those regenerative braking dots appear. And similarly, when the car is truly dead, right around negative two, negative three miles, you'll start to see a limit on your acceleration. So unfortunately, that wasn't a difference that really turned out to be material. And I think that's kind of true with everything about this vehicle. There are all these little changes that might have incremental impact on the user experience, but for the most part, Tesla's really not trying to Osborne themselves here. And this is, again, for the most part, the same vehicle you'd get from Fremont. So I hope you enjoyed me trying to look and find all these little differences. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.